We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. If you're scientifically literate, the world looks very different to you. It's not just a lot of mysterious things happening. There's a lot we understand out there. And that understanding empowers you. If you base medicine on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. If you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. Welcome back to Really Radio 166, recorded Friday, September 29th, 2017, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really? I'm your host, Andy Cowan, with my usual suspect, Daniel Atherton. Welcome back, sir. Thanks for having me. And we're going to get our ass to Mars this time with a little bit of science here. Uh, again, we make mistakes, so if you find one, go ahead and let us know about it at a really radio podcast at gmail.com or phone it in at 470-222-6759. Also, and, uh, as always, thank you to our Patreon supporters, Donald Davis, Melissa G., Henry, and the Dan Daniel Duncan from the Problem Addict Podcast. Thank you very much. All right. So, uh, this week, in fact, today, was it today? It was earlier. Uh, <laughs> it was one of these it days. It was today. It actually was today. Okay. So, uh, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk, um, he's got some plans. And he's, he's well known for having these weird plans, uh, you know, electric cars and solar roofs and spacecraft and all sorts of things. Well, he's expanded and updated his vision for Mars colonization. So I think that we haven't really done kind of a deep dive into Mars colonization. No. Uh, we have touched on it fondly. <laughs> we have frequently said, uh, as our, our, our favorite uh, foiled fellow <laughs> yes. likes to say, we need to get our butts off this rock. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, uh, David O'Connor and O'Connor's House of Tinfoil Hats definitely um, <laughs> definitely says that we got to get off this rock. So um, today... Uh, I have an article out from the Planetary Society, which was actually founded by Carl Sagan, who was in our little little uh, er earlier segment there. Um, mm -hmm. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk presented an updated version of his Mars colonization plans today during a widely anticipated talk at the 68th International Astronautical Congress in Ad Adelaide, Australia. The new concept features a slightly smaller rocket and spacecraft design for a broader range of applications beyond Mars, including a moon base and point-to-point -point Earth transport. SpaceX will eventually phase out its Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, and Dragon vehicles completely, relying on its new Mars architecture for all missions. Now, when they say slightly smaller rocket, they're saying slightly smaller in what ambitions they had previously. This is not a smaller rocket than the Falcon 9 or the Falcon Heavy. This sucker's huge. <laughs> it's more powerful than the Saturn V by a lot. <laughs> it's it's going to need to be. It's serious. It's serious business. Um, let's see. So the, the, the 2016 concept of the booster, just to give you some numbers, because we, we like numbers, the width of the concept originally was 12 meters. This new one is 9 meters, which is probably wise because um, things like the, um, if you remember the space shuttle, you know, us old folks, you know, we remember the space shuttle. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's not that old, but yeah. The liquid fuel tank on that, couldn't be any larger. Do you know why it couldn't be any larger? No, I do not know offhand. offhand. Train tunnels. Oh. Because NASA is so diversified by mandate, because it has to have you know resources in all, all 50 states to be able to funnel in, things had to be shipped. So... 
it had to be able to fit on infrastructure that existed. So things like that were an issue. This is why we need a new infrastructure bill. Maybe. Maybe. But it's really... Because Australia's game, the space game, that came out this week. Oh, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, so as comparison, um, the Saturn V was 10 meters. So, again, that would be something that would fit on modern infrastructure. Well, yeah, not modern, I guess current infrastructure. Current. So this allows them to actually get things through tunnels and things like that. I'm surprised they even theorized 12 meters, unless they were going to do everything in-house and not bother with any land transport systems. That could have been an original idea, just try and keep it all local. Yeah. Uh, The full height was originally supposed to be 122 meters tall. Uh, Now it's down to 106 the Saturn V was is is 111. Uh, the SLS, which is the Space Launch System, which is NASA's uh, baby for this, is 98 meters. So it's a bit taller than that. Um, also, the SLS uh, is 8.4 meters in uh, in width. So again, it's it's right in that uh, in that sweet it's in that, it's in that zone. sweet zone of being able to be put on a train car and and shoveled through the country. Uh, As far as engines, the 2016 concept had 42 engines. 42. Uh, This new concept for 2017 has 31. As comparison, the Soviet N1 moon rocket had 30. That's a lot. I I don't know much about the Soviet N1, but uh, it's there. So, also, originally, they were thinking um, of 28.7 million pounds of thrust in the 2016 concept with those 42 engines. Apparently, these 31 engines are going to be a, a bit on the um, less robust side, and it's going to be 10.8 million pounds of thrust, which is still... A lot uh, more that, than the Saturn V. Saturn V was 7.9 million pounds. And the space shuttle, 7.8 million pounds of thrust. Having seen that launch, it's it's a window rattler. So this will be interesting. This will be very interesting. Uh, reuse, uh, the 2016 concept was designed, you know, it, it had longevity in its uh, thoroughbred here. So 1,000 times they were hoping to reuse each craft. That's major. That, that is ambitious. That's, that's serious. And I think that they might be able to get at least 100. Because, I mean, look, look at what they're doing with the Falcon 9. They've got that as a test bed for all sorts of new technology and reuse. They've already changed out the directional fins for when they come in for reentry to... Um, uh, cast titanium, I think it was. Be- and they didn't bother to um, uh, paint them because they got so hot it would just dissolve the paint. Yeah, what's the point? Yeah, there's no point. So, yeah, some some interesting things. Uh, they have not specified any longevity for the 2017 concept, but apparently the uh, Space Shell Discovery launched 39 times. So, Well, there's some data for you. Yeah, but that was also... A big, expensive refit every time. Yeah, getting the ceramic panels and everything just a okay. Yeah, it was all because of the way it came back. That that is really the problem. Yeah. yeah. The fl- the brick. Yes, the flying brick, the slightly aerodynamic brick. Uh, as far as transport, they got the same number of people. They want to carry. 100 passengers, 100 people on board each one of these. So that that has remained uh, consistent. Well, um, they're guaranteeing more leg room than they can find on most U- U.S. carriers. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Apparently there was something like 40 cabins. Because, again, you're going to be 
you're going to be in this thing for months. Yeah, you're going to be in a while. Yeah. You're going to be in it for months on the way to, to Mars. Six to nine, depending on how, how they're doing it. Yeah. Well, they're going to do it on the closest approach. I think they were only talking like up to four months. So they they might be talking about a a, wow. sig- a significant um, acceleration. That that's punching it. Yeah, and we'll we'll get into just how they they plan on on doing things like that too. A little, at least a little bit. Uh, initial cost estimate: They were thinking that the uh, the twenty sixteen concept was going to cost ten billions for R and D, and that's probably going to be in the same same neighborhood. Of research and development cost, and, and just getting it off the ground. Yeah. Um, single booster tanker transport estimate: five hundred and sixty million was the original thought. <sighs> but the space shuttle Endeavor cost one point seven billion. So. It's in the ballpark. In also in in twenty sixteen dollars. The space shuttle program in 1972 was a $30 billion research and development project. And this is a private entity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They can do it. I mean, it's it's going to happen at this point. Um, as far as testing, the original timeline was booster tests in 2019, orbital tests in 2020, Mars 2022. Now, I want to give context to that number because mm-hmm. <clears throat> I did a quick little look, and NASA yeah. is trying to get people to Mars in the 2030s yeah. is their goal. Yeah, but that would be on the SLS. Yeah. The space launch system, not on this. But that's just to to give context between private and public entity, and what yep. these two, th- their goals, what their their timelines are. Now, of course, also of note is uh, Elon Musk is um, aggressive with his timelines, and yeah. usually fails at meeting them. Uh. By the average that they say, even in the article that we're citing, two years. Yeah. Well, we we have the history of you know solar roofs. We have the history mm-hmm. of, of the electric cars. You know the Teslas. Most of his things, he thinks he can get it done earlier. But he's, I think he's gotten a little bit better with uh, lowering his... the expectation that that's going to be the fir- the firm number. Yeah. yeah. It's a goal. He... He, he he has a lot softer numbers now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Much softer. By the way, this is uh, leaded coffee. This is this is some stout stuff. Okay. All right. <laughs> Lots of Kahlua. That's good. Okay. Um, but now the the new timeline. Uh, they want two cargo landers on Mars by 2022. So that would be the supply missions. To have stuff set up there. Yeah, yeah, and then they want four landers, two of them crewed, by 2024. So they're putting, by this, 200 people on Mars in 2024. Yeah. That's uh, seven years? Yeah. And if he's only two years off, that's nine years. That's less than a decade. That's that's crazy. You know, there are some people out there that have a five-year plan. There are some people out there that have a ten-year plan. My ten-year plan does not involve another planet. <laughs> but it for might, our Tony Stark, it does. It might involve another state. <laughs> but, you know, it does not involve another planet. So I'm... um. I'm I'm applause 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 um uh the the biggest problem was in paying for it because it's a big expensive project and to be done from uh from just a a private business standpoint 
Why? Why would you do it? So, uh, according to the article, in order to make the rocket affordable, Musk said SpaceX will rely on cost savings from reusability, as well as combining all the company's vehicles into a single product line. We want to have one booster and ship that replaces Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, and Dragon, he said. If we can do that, all those resources can be applied to the system. Musk said the, tar- the larger transport ship would enhance the company's core business offering, launching satellites. Um, well, that, that is the core business, launching satellites. Yeah. Uh, he showed off an artist concept of the Mars craft, deploying a supersized version of the Hubble Space Telescope into Earth orbit, and also said the transport ship could capture defunct satellites and other space debris for return to Earth. Which is a giant market. That's huge. That's huge, and nobody else is really talking about that uh, except for uh, college kids with some crazy ideas about netting things and yeah. bringing them into lower bring it, Bringing them down mm-hmm. with the nets and guiding them so that their impacts are typically in a ocean. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's getting bad up there. Uh, I mean, most of the stuff will, will break up and burn up on, on reentry because it's small enough to do that. Yeah, but uh, the problem is that it's in an orbit that is stable enough that that's not going to happen for a really long time on its own. And it's getting cluttered up there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you end up with the the possibility of, I think it's called uh, the cascade, where if one breaks up, it breaks up into a thousand pieces or something like that, and then those thousand pieces are then capable of breaking up other things into another thousand pieces, and then you have this this exponential expansion of space debris bringing down horrible things, making low Earth orbit and just Earth orbit uninhabitable and untransitable. Yeah, you're you're trying to go through a screen of birdshot yeah. with anything that you're throwing up there. Yeah, it'd be ugly. I mean, we're humans. We'll figure it out. But we've also made the problem. Now we need to, now we need fix to solve it. the problem. And this is a means to fix it. Mm-hmm. NASA currently plans to construct a small space station in lunar orbit called the Deep Space Gateway. Oh, that just delights me. Mm-hmm. So that's a NASA plan. This isn't Musk. And that yeah. could serve as a jumping off point for commercial and or international partners interested in landing on the moon. There is speculation the Trump administration might direct NASA to get more involved with surface operations, leading multiple companies to pursue, uh, uh, no, to present lunar vehicle concepts that could compete for government funding. Notably, Lockheed Martin presents, uh, presented a Mars lander of its own earlier today and said that design was flexible enough for lunar applications. And we've talked in the past that... Um, Blue Origin, which is Jeff Bezos' uh, private company, yeah. is really gung-ho on the moon and having people I... live both in low Earth, in, in Earth orbit, in space, and on the moon. And there's tons of reasons for it. Yeah. Absolutely. That's... One, just there's stuff that you can do in low gravity... And zero G that you can't do in gravity. There's science experiments that we can conduct in in those conditions mm-hmm. that we can't even replicate down here. Yeah, and can unlock new science to to all sorts of stuff. Better manufacturing, uh, better bioscience. I mean, stuff grows at different rates depending on gravity. Oh my. He's got some interesting ideas. Um, okay. So one of the problems that you might be thinking is, okay, well, you've gotten out of the gravity well. Now what? What they're going to do is they put the, they put the, the, the spacecraft in orbit. Then they land the booster. And they refuel the booster. And they send it back up. And it transfers the fuel back to the spaceship. So it'd be two flights, two launches, to get this thing either to Mars or to the moon. 
Now, I'm sure that if he wanted to, because we've seen this with the Falcon 9, if you need to make something that's a particularly high orbit, you essentially sacrifice the launch vehicle because it expends all of its fuel in order to get there. So in this, it keeps it reusable because it doesn't use all of the all of the fuel. Comes back down, lands. So this is all about turnaround time. How long are you going to leave them in low Earth orbit? Or I keep saying low Earth orbit in orbit. Yeah. Waiting for that refuel. Maybe not that long at all. Well, if you cycle the rockets. Right. The problem is, how long? before one used vehicle is able to go up again. Yeah, that's where you have the crunch. So you need to figure out, okay, just how many rockets you have to have on hand. Right. Hmm. But at minimum, minimum one, if you can get that turnaround time fast enough. If. Yeah. Two, to be comfortable, to know for a fact that you can go get that fuel up there. Not bad. Not really. No. In the grand scheme of of Elon Musk land. You know, pretty good. So uh, he said that a single tank of fuel delivered in Earth orbit would be enough for the transport ship to travel to the lunar surface and return uh, without any surface mining. So this is all about just using the resources that we have on hand, not inc- not completely developing a new industry off-planet. Which is good to, to have that plan. And finally, a wildly ambitious revenue stream for the project could be point-to-point Earth flights. SpaceX released a new video depicting a 39-minute passenger flight from New York to Shanghai. There would be a market for that. I don't know. I don't. I don't know that there really would be. I mean, no. th- there wasn't really a market for um, Concord for the Concord. Yeah, the, there. Not enough to keep it alive. Not enough to keep it alive, as a, a supplementary revenue stream. Maybe. Maybe I don't know where, where you have a seasonal window where you do these. Now, one thing that. That is mentioned there is Shanghai. Yeah. So are we talking about another spaceport in Shanghai? That SpaceX will use? That is a good question. Because I'm just, you know, okay, well, let's let's take this to the next extent. Let's ask those, those hard okay. questions. It's like, okay, so you want to go from... New York, so wait, we're going to put a spaceport in New York. New York. And we're going to put one one in in Shanghai. So how many spaceports are we talking here? How many ports across the globe are you going to have in service? Right. Where are they located? What's the infrastructure? I mean, New York is is way up there on on latitude, which is not the best place to, to launch from. But it, I guess it wouldn't be bad if you're going to do a hop across the pole. Because you'd be flying over Canada. Yeah. Yeah, that wouldn't be too bad. But that's all that would be good for. It wouldn't be great for actually launching into, into orbit. I mean, it's, no. it's certainly possible. No, and you would use it just for your your a few point points, but that's again, you have to have the areas where you can land. Yeah. Then refuel, have that turnaround to refuel, reuse, relaunch. Yeah. Now it it could also be interesting because they they also do have plans for a moon base as well. So they're they're trying to cover all the bases. So not only huh, all the bases, all your base are belong to us. They they've got the plan for having the moon base 
above and beyond what NASA or another company might do. So it's going to get really interesting in the next 10 years. Yeah. It's going to be fun to watch. It will be. It will be. Um, SpaceX's previous plan called for landing its first transport ship on Mars in 2022. The timeline gave today was similar to cargo landers in 2022. Four vehicles launched in 2024. Two of those would be crewed. Um, yeah, seven years. Says that's not a typo, though it is aspirational. So he knows he's really... He's pushing he's it. He's pushing it. He's pushing it hard. Um SpaceX is known for its overly ambitious timelines. The company, uh, company's yet to be launched. Falcon Heavy was originally stated to fly as late 2013 uh, on average. So we're four years off from that. Yeah. So we'll see about how that is. But yeah, two years on average. Uh, Musk did, however, note that the company was on track to launch up to 30 rockets in 2018. Half the world's missions, just about. Yeah. That's going to be pretty crazy. Fundamentally, the future is vastly more exciting if we are a space-faring civilization and a multi-planet species than if we're not, he said. Not wrong. Not wrong at all. Really hard to argue with on, on that. Uh so it's an evolving concept. It's it's very interesting. And there's many that say that we shouldn't go to Mars at all. Why? Because it doesn't have an atmosphere. It doesn't have a magnetic field. It is a dead planet. Well, last I checked, the moon didn't have an atmo. And it does not have a magnetic field either. It It has a special place in our heart, though, because it's close. Mars is, okay, moon is a stepping stone. Mars yeah. is a stepping stone. You need to have, again, it's that long-term view versus short-term. Right. It's and it's not the, this is our final destination. It is. No. It's just a point this is how we. This is how we refine the technology to make it so that we can, as a species be something greater than just being on this rock. Multi-planet survivability is rather important. Yeah. Well, yeah, we've heard that a lot from our greatest minds. Yeah. But, no, it, it, just, just for the sake of, you know, being all that we can, doing all that we can, this, this is it. <laughs> Yeah. This is the next grand adventure. Have you um have you read or watched uh The Expanse? No, I have not. Okay, that's homework for you. Okay. You need to I would suggest reading it cuz it's way better. I think that the visual appeal of the TV show I think they they did it justice, they really did, but there's certain certain aspects that can only be derived from text. Your mind's eye is definitely gonna gonna pop those things out, and the vision that that it paints, it's two co-authors um, writing under under one pen name. Hmm. Uh, it's. It is a solar system that is fully populated. There are the Martians. There are the Belters. There are the Terrans. The Belters are the ones that have, you know, they've, they live in space on the asteroid belt doing the mining. They're rather an oppressed class of people. Shocking, right? Uh... The Martians are technologically advanced because they have to be, because that's what they're doing. They have the best ships. They have some of the best tech. They're trying to terraform Mars. Mostly they live in domes and under, underground, but the goal is to terraform Mars, and they're working on it constantly. 
And there's um, giant greenhouses on Ganymede. You know, I mean, it, all of them. It's it's a a well thought out use of the solar system. And even the even the ships don't have artificial gravity. They're built for gravity under thrust. So you live on a ship that is under thrust all the time. So it's only when you flip or you're in a station keeping orbit or anything like that that suddenly you're weightless. Otherwise it's gravity as a percentage of thrust. It's really accurate, I think, in its kind of depiction of how we would do this. Hard sci-fi is good. Hard sci-fi is good. And it's got some some not so hard sci-fi elements too, which makes it even better. Um, and I don't want to give any spoilers, but just for the way that it depicts the action of the technology and how we live and interact with each other in space and on these planets, it is just amazing and really eye-opening. You know, it's it's not Star Trek. It doesn't have, you know, the artificial gravity and the phasers and photon torpedoes and things like that. No, it's kinetic rounds and, and some nasty things like that. Um, because that's Sir Isaac Newton is the deadliest that's in right. space. That's right, yes. <laughs> kinetic kill shots are bad news, bad news. You do not eyeball it. Yes. <laughs> Actually, there, there was a scene... Um, in one of the later books, so you'll know it when you get to it. But in order to give the vehicle more thrust, more directional thrust, they fire up the damn railgun and use it as a point source. <laughs> because that's what happens. It still has a kick. Everything For every action, there's an opposite reaction in space. If you launch something one way... You're the, pushing the, the other way. You're pushing the other way. That's just how it works. So, you know, even even by satellites great, you know, changing their direction on a planet, you are stealing energy from that planet. You are stealing the motion from that planet, slowing it down infinitesimally, but still, you're doing that. So, those little things, you know, you got to keep all of that in mind in space. And it's some it's some really neat uh, neat hard sci-fi, and I highly recommend it. And it's several books, which I love the series and the sagas. So, and they're they're gonna do uh, do more. I think it's uh, who was it? Uh, I can't remember the name of the author, but it's the Expanse series. Uh, it starts with uh, Leviathan Wakes. So I I highly recommend jumping in that as quickly as possible. It's great. And, of course, uh, speaking of getting to, getting your ass to Mars, there's um, Andy Weir's novel, The Martian, which mm-hmm. is also heavy, heavy, hard science. Because yep. he did all the calculations. All of it's accurate. You know, even some of the NASA scientists, you know, were calling him up saying, how did you know that? <laughs> But he has he has a great story on how he wrote that book in the first place. He actually wrote it in public. So it was bits and pieces published to a blog, essentially, and then people would tear it apart and give feedback and corrections on how this was happening here and there and there and there. But all the all the things you that he has crowdsourced your science. He crowdsourced the science, yeah. And he did he also is just Jeez. A huge space geek, too, and, and actually did crunch a lot of the numbers. And, you know, figured out when he wanted something to happen because of other story elements and things like that. So he had to then figure out the orbital paths based on certain maneuvers that were done, and it is all accurate. The, the big thing that is a gimme, and it's no, no big surprise... Mars does not have a significant atmosphere. Though they will have dust storms that will rage on for an awfully long time, they're not like a dust storm here on the planet where wind has a lot of mass on its own. So Andy Weir, he has uh, Mark Watney, 
who is the main character, he gets into a, a dust storm on Mars and ends up getting hit with an antenna from a huge gust of wind in this dust storm. And it hits his biomonitor, and the rest of his crew thinks he's dead. But they've been given the evacuation order, and they have to leave, and they leave him on Mars. And it's all about him surviving alone on Mars. On Mars. And, yes, he does have to science the shit out of this. <laughs> yeah. And he does. And he does. And it's great. Um, there was no end of the number of things that could have happened to poor Mark Watney. Uh, again, the movie was good. Matt Damon was good. But it did not capture the innate humor of the character. And there was more, a lot more, of how he figured things out, how he got over those problems. Well, again, It is one such a good book. One of the things that one struggles with in the art of film, uh, and even the medium of television, is internal monologue. Mm -hmm. It is, is hard to deliver internal monologue without hurting or damaging the suspension of disbelief. Oh, but wait. He did it in a wonderful way. Have you not read it? Uh, no, I have not read it. Have you seen the movie? No. My God, man, you have so much homework. Okay. Uh, I have a back catalog of tons <laughs> of stuff, okay? It, I need, like, three separate lifetimes. Oh, trust me, I know. I know. Backlog. I know. Uh, well, audiobooks are fantastic for these things. I've, I've done all of the uh, Expanse series, and uh, I've read The Martian on Audible uh, probably six times. It's just that good. It really is. Uh, but it's handled not in an inner monologue way at all. They're log entries. No, that, 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 that's it's, fantastic. It's beautiful. That's how, yeah. that's how, that's great for text. It's, it's great for text. <laughs> yeah. But again, I'm, I'm going from a background for, for of, the movie, of his, film uh, and television. Yeah. Is that there is always something lost when you you take something that is a novel mm -hmm. or or even a comic book, yeah, and and transferring it to screen, and that one of the first things that's hurt is internal monologue. Yeah. Also, um, one of the things that is a large criticism of filmmakers in this day and age is show don't tell which is hard to do with yeah. a lot of what we we consume as media now because we consume now so much more books than we give ourselves credit for we uh, the millennials read a lot i suppose and, yeah. i mean we're part the of the reason why the libraries haven't closed <laughs> that's that's true. That's true. There is there is still a purpose. Is cheap, delightful entertainment, and it's your tax dollars at work. Take advantage. Yes, support your um, local library. No, support. Go use. Enjoy. Um, but yeah, no, it's just as much as we we like to see our 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 shows and consume them through television and film. A story. The, in its transfer, it loses something. It loses a an element of intimacy. Well, it's it's the headline versus the long form. Yeah. Also, you uh, know, there's so much more that can be fit into those pages. You can go on a long exposition, whereas in the in the visual media, you do have to let that picture speak a thousand words. Yeah. And occasionally, I will give the Martian credit. The movie, that is. Uh, they tried to have certain vignettes with Matt Damon that encapsulated the emotional feeling of everything that was going on. And that's something that you can definitely have a skilled actor do. 
you know, it, so there were some things that I would have liked to see more of the, okay, you're going to say, because they, they were like video logs as opposed to just, you know, a text log entry. They were him, you know, sitting in front of a camera and actually doing the, the video log, you know, which is a, a, a nice trope for sci-fi. It works very well for the media. And honestly, I think probably with the amount of vlogging that people are doing now, it's actually probably more contemporary than anything else. It, it, it It's contemporary. It's acceptable. Yeah. It's understandable. Yeah. So it's it's really getting there. Um, and so he had had that. And, and I would have liked to have him just like, OK, you started that off and then narrate kind of a little bit and then go into him actually performing the action so that you could see a little bit more of that interaction like having to having to go pick up the RTG having to having to you know clean out the uh, the O2 separator you know all these things you know things that that had to happen that were mild story elements but you know you've got the prop it's there you might as well have him interact with it <laughs> you know also stuff's cut for time yeah uh, a lot of it I'm imagining yeah, um, you you have time to enjoy a a book. Yeah, you do not have necessarily time to enjoy a film, or even a TV series. It yeah. it, it you have constraints. Um, the the novel has almost no constraints when it comes to the luxury of time. Yeah, that's true. Now there are, there are a few other uh, novelizations of. Mars and terraforming, um, and if if you happen to have a few of them out there, listener, uh, go ahead and you know give us give us your feedback. Tell us what you yeah. what you recommend us to read, so that we have a better idea or, of, of how this would be. I, I know there's a series like uh, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. I think it is, um, and I can't remember who it was. I know that if we had Michael on, he would be uh, shouting at me right now. Yeah, about what they were, but. Uh, as for your pen name for the expanse, it's uh, James S. A. Corey. Yes. Um, that that's that one. No, but I honestly need three lifetimes to get through my back catalog. I mean, I still, I'm currently working on my personal goal of being fluent in another language aside from English, and <laughs> working on that. Good luck, sir. Good luck. Um, it was Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson did uh, the series Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, and then okay. a series of short stories uh, for the Martians. Uh, and apparently these are also just fantastic, hard sci-fi, how you would terraform the planet. You know, big stuff. So over, like, a couple hundred years, you know, several hundred years of how that would happen. So... Uh, Red Mars, uh, 1993, Green Mars, 1994, and Blue Mars, 1996, and The Martians, 99. Um, fictional universe, sort of semi-fictional universe. Uh, trilogy, da, 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 da. eh, you can go look at that if you need to. But yeah, that's uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. Not to be confused with something that Dr. Seuss would do. <laughs> Red Mars, two moons, you know, something like that. I don't know. Oh, so we could probably go on and on about about uh, the way Mars would be. Um, I'm, I'm envisioning that probably domes on the surface would be hard. However, tunnels again, this is actually under tying, the surface would be best. Tying back into uh, Musk's boring company. Yeah. And doing tests here in, in similar conditions, similar soil, similar weather, and figuring all that out. Yeah. He's really done very well with meshing all of his things together, you know, well, as building again, blocks. The solar really technologies good. are going to be key mm -hmm. for power. Yeah. Absolutely key. There's no. There's no fossil fuels up there. It's what you bring with you. Right. Well, there so, might be fossil fuels, but you got to find them. Yeah, you don't really have the luxury. There, there, There's no gas station right there on Mars. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Not at all. So, 
again, batteries. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's part of the reason why we're looking at Shanghai. Maybe. Maybe for the industrial base to continue. To... Well, he's already got the biggest battery factory in the world. Yeah, but the technology is being refined every day. Yeah. And you know who's sitting on the one of the largest lithium deposits in the world? No idea. Afghanistan. It still has resources that the rest of the world seeks to plunder. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, I, I from Alexander to now, what the hell is wrong with that? <laughs> it's just in the wrong place, man. That's oh. all it is. It's just caught in the middle all the time. <laughs> it doesn't. It will never end. No, it probably won't. That's just how it is. Oh, so yeah, there's um, one of the other caveats that uh, that was given to uh, the Martian that Andy Weir just, you know, he had to, he had to like, okay, in order for this to happen, the guy's got to have a good spacesuit that he can get in and out of on his own and still have flexibility to do all these things. So one of the gimmies was to have a better spacesuit, something that you, that was flexible, that he could get in and out of on his own, you know, all that. Yeah. What did Elon Musk do? SpaceX. SpaceX has developed a better spacesuit along with Boeing. So, those are there. I mean, we're we're well, se we're seeing the fan fantasy. Uh, yeah. It, it well, I mean, the entire reason we have cell phones is Star Trek. Yeah. That's the entire reason we have cell phones. Well, it's. It's one of the reasons. It's certainly the reason why we had a clamshell. The <laughs> no, the, the flip guy, phone is the guys completely. who came up with, with the first cell phone technologies were inspired by Star Trek. Now, for yeah. me, and, and me growing up, I didn't want a cell phone. I I wanted the the wristwatch communicator from Dick Tracy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, battery that, technology is the problem there. Yeah. No, I and nowadays I just want you know, give me my Pip Boy. I got him up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I want a a small, comfortable. Yeah, it's not wrist mounted. No, that's my my. Yeah. Give me the flexible screen technology, the better battery technology, and be able to have everything there. Well, spe speaking of things like that, uh, one of the things that's that's coming up, uh, Samsung has a flexible, foldable screen. Mm -hmm. So the it would be a screen on both sides, and you would hinge it open, and it would end up being a full big screen. And that's apparently something that they're going to be doing uh, in one of the next Note versions, like probably the Note. 11 or something like that delightful yeah it's of course we're also in the thousand dollar territory for phones now which is just astronomical and it hurts me well part of that is because of just wealth disparity some yeah well wealth inequality again you're going to see the price of luxury goods go up and up because the uh, the, the the wealthy can't afford it margin yeah it's just what, what can be done. The half-dots are going to be the half-dots. It, it, if you want to have a, a similar uh, historical touchstone, um, going to shift over to sneakers. Early uh, 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that movie. <laughs> well, I wasn't talking about the movie. I was actually talking about the shoes. Oh, okay. Well, sneakers. <laughs> all right, all right. No, shoes. <laughs> early, late 80s, early 90s. Um, especially in the sportswear stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, kids were getting killed for their, their shoes. Yeah, a pair of Jordans would... Yeah. yeah. And this is what we're, we're getting into now with phones. Even um, one of the radio programs in Orlando, uh, The Monsters, uh, on WTKS 104.1, mm -hmm. they do a program called Kicks for Guns, along with uh, many of the 
police agencies where they will go out and they'll buy a whole bunch of shoes and you bring in a gun, you get shoes. So no questions even, asked. So even yeah. today, that is still a prevalent thing where people would rather have the, the nice sneakers than a 45 then, or whatever. Yeah. No, I'm all for Kicks for Guns programs as well as other gang. We have too many guns. Yeah. As a country, we have way, way too many guns. Yeah. We need, we need a lot less gun. I understand. They're fun. They're nifty. Yeah. But you know what? We have too many of them. Also, I work right next to a, a, a gun club. Oh. Okay. You you want to go and enjoy firearms? You can do it in a controlled and safe environment. Yeah. You can leave it there. Yeah. Under lock and key. You you can go and have fun. You don't need to own it. Yeah, there's that too. Yeah. If you absolutely have to own it, but you know you can you can also keep it in, in a safe way. You know. But nobody needs an arsenal. No. No. You just don't. Okay, you know what's great for home defense? Baseball bat. Dog. <laughs> That's more of a warning system. Yeah. Uh, but also, most of the time when you're dealing with a home invader, it's going to be close. Yeah. You know what else deals with things at close range? Knives. A Roman Gladius. Well, yes. It is often cheaper than getting a firearm. You don't have to have as many permits. <laughs> it's not going to accidentally go off. No, it will not. <laughs> a Gladius will not accidentally go off. <laughs> and it's at a short enough range that you can use it and maneuver with it in your home and in close quarters. I would I would go one step for uh, more removed than that and just get yourself a machete. You want something that you can thrust with. Machetes don't thrust well. The good ones you can. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen them where they, you can bend them. Those yeah, but, those aren't know, the ones you want to buy. Typically, you want you want to get the ones with their they're the straight up Bushmaster variety with the sawtooth on the back. Those no. got some rigidity to them. They're good. Uh, again, the for you want something that can cut and thrust in a home defense scenario when it comes to to some form. Of, of weapon, or you can always do just something straight up bludgeoning. Baseball bat's perfectly good, yeah. but I know plenty of, of markets for reenactors and collectors for maces. Yeah. And a good mace, you know what? You don't have to worry about edge alignment. All you have to do worry about is actually hitting them. And you know what? They're going to run away. Blunt force trauma uh, really is effective. No matter what. Yeah. And added bonus, you're less likely to kill them. Just maim them. Yeah. Well, that that's the same thing with the machete, too. You're less likely to kill them. But if you're doing the, you know, parry thrust, then then you're looking at internal organs. Yes. And the, you're going to kill I them. Give you, <laughs> I, I will give you that the machete is more than likely lethal. Well, it's uh, well, less. It's gladius. it's less lethal than the gladius. <laughs> the, the gladius is a, a more permanent solution. But if you feel the need for something that is going to keep you safe, and you want an yeah. alternative to a firearm, one, it's cheaper, it's easier to maintain, and it's safer for your home. Yes, yes. But a gladius will also get you some looks. If you don't want looks, and you happen to live in, say, Florida, for instance. Owning a machete, not a big deal. Sometimes you got to clear out the brush. Nobody bats an eye at a machete. Hey, Gladius <laughs> is a beautiful thing to have in your home. It's a conversation piece. Yes, and can be a conversation starter and stopper, depending on the conversation and the quality thereof. But, again, it is easier to maintain than a firearm. You need less permits. You can have it in your home, and yeah. it is much safer. And you could even uh, carry it around in Texas. Oh, yeah. No, you can go full Highlander in Texas. Open carry. Uh, Absolutely. Open carry of swords. Yeah, because Texas is Texas. Well, <sighs> when you can open carry firearms, you might as well be able to open carry swords. Might as well. Might as well. It makes sense. 
trust me, as as somebody who wishes he had the money to collect weapons, not guns, I will I will love me some swords, I love me some pole arms. I would love to have myself a a small sword, uh, which is a purely thrust weapon, or a a good um a good rondel dagger, something that's meant for thrusting and is not going to break easily. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, if if you are going to go with with the daggers, make sure that you go with just just a, a straight blade because there are some that are like trilobe, and those are designed to cause more bleeding. Uh, not no, that's actually a a bit of a misnomer. I've been doing a lot a well, of. <clears throat> let me let me look. I'm looking at it from a law enforcement point of view. If you use one of those, it's going to go poorly for you. I I because I it is de- it is designed to create a wound that is difficult to stop bleeding. No, it's it's not with modern quick clot and everything else we have access to. The, uh, 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 that is a deflection because it's still the intent of the weapon. Remember, no, legally, the, inten- the intent of the, the weapon is the weapon kill. if you're looking at the, the triangular cross-section or even diamond have, cross-section. We have gone far afield from Mars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, you're getting into my wheelhouse now. Um, well, hang on, hang on. Let's, let's wrap the show because okay. <laughs> clearly we've gone off the rails. So it's time to, time to wrap up. So Indeed. thank you, everyone. If you've enjoyed what we've done here and you'd like to help us out, there's a few ways you can do that. You can send us reviews and, and things like that of, of uh, movies and TV shows and books that you think that we ought to read to, to bone up on, on how Mars ought to be. And you can also make the algorithms work for us by re- reviewing us on iTunes to boost our ranking. Also, uh, how about you donate to the show through patreon.com slash radio to get uh, get more weird stuff like we're, what we're about to talk about. And also, uh, use your words. Tell somebody about us. And, of course, engage with us directly. Send us a message on those social medias with all those reviews and the electronic mails at Podcast at gmail.com. Or if they're more talkative sort, 470 222 O R L Y. That's six seven five nine. It's always ready to take your call or your text. And if you don't like what we've done here this evening, you can contact the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. Available twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. The Lifeline provides free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention, and crisis resources for you or your loved ones and best practices for professionals. Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time on us. This has been a Really Radio, part of the Random Acts Company. This work licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 United States license, including the music Rocket and Pemgia, created by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Or you can kind of stick around and, you know, listen to us gab about stabbing people, apparently. Because that's fun. Uh, weapons are great things. <laughs> And with that, good night, everybody. <laughs>